This is a wizard's guide to understanding vacuum and vacuum coating. This, I'm Don McClure. Uh, I have a consulting company, Acuity Training and Consulting, and I'm a 3M employee, retired. What our objectives are is to learn about vacuum and vacuum coating, but also to have fun. And I think uh, most people who have done saw this presentation have, have had fun. We'll use tabletop demonstrations. We're going to use a transparent vacuum chamber so you can see what's going on inside the vacuum chamber to see the principles of vacuum in action. If you can't see this, you want to be able to move now so you can see it later. Um, the strategy here from an educational point of view is things that you see are easy to remember, things that you remember are easier to understand. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to use highly accessible, thought-provoking demonstrations and descriptions and it's suitable for both technical and non-technical individuals. The only required background is a curiosity about our amazing world. We cover a, a range of topics, including pressure, air, and vacuum. We'll talk about vacuum pumps, the many ways a vacuum wizard uses to produce good vacuum levels. We'll talk about vacuum measurement methods, how vacuum wizards know what the level of the vacuum is inside their chambers of various shapes and sizes. We're going to be talking about some extremes in temperature, very high temperatures, and how we make coatings by evaporation, and some very low temperatures, and how we use those uh, for pumping and removing gases from chambers. And we'll talk a lot about how materials change from a solid to a liquid to a gas and back, of, back again. And that's how vacuum coating is done. We'll talk about the mean free path maybe new to many of you, and why vacuum wizards care about what the mean free path is. We'll talk about why low pressures are needed to make vacuum coatings and why the low pressures needed are, can be so different in different applications. And then we'll close by showing you examples of some uh, state-of-the-art coating systems and products. Other people have taken this class. This is, I think, the 11th time I presented it. Wow, I really enjoyed Don's class. Don's wizard program was simply amazing. It brought to life the fundamentals that you only read about. I now have a clear understanding of what's going on inside that vacuum chamber. And this is from a vacuum technical sales representative who happens to be local to the Twin Cities area. I wanted to thank you for a superb job with the program. For a guy who's been in the industry for 38 years, it was good, refreshing, and entertaining, along with being educational. And for my, my new associate, his new wife, actually, at a starting level, it provided a good basic understanding. Excellent presentation. It helped to bring terminology to life with demonstrations. Excellent demonstrations. The demonstrations are very good. Excellent seminar. What an experience. And basically, people have recommended it to people from all walks of life. So some wizards try to mystify you. My task is to demystify, remove the mystery from these topics. Uh, it's become sort of uh, apropos to, to show you a corporate headquarters where I work. Uh, this is a, a lake in northwestern Wisconsin. That's my house. That's my corporate headquarters. If I look across the road, I have a nice uh, farm field across there and down the lake. It's mostly an unoccupied lake because of the geography, so we have a nice quiet spot. Um, it's appropriate to give my background. I started out in Whispering Pine Nursery School, and most of the rest of it doesn't make any difference, but we'll cover that later if you're interested. What are we really going to do? We're going to be talking about concepts related to vacuum and vacuum coating, specific, specifically thin films and the technology used to produce those films. We're going to get a feel for the concepts. We're not going to become experts. If equations like this make you feel like that, or like that, don't worry, because doing the math is not as important as getting a feeling for what the math says. And what are we going to do? We'll use no complicated math. We are going to use some graphs. I'll try to explain what they mean, because some of them are a little confusing. But most of all, we'll use everyday experiences and demonstrations. We'll start with one right now. Um, I've got my little vacuum pump here, which I'll introduce in a moment. So now I, that snap was a rubber membrane being broken by the vacuum, and we're going to use that and come back and talk about that a little bit later in more detail, but I just wanted to get your attention. 
Vacuum is not part of most people's ordinary everyday experience. In fact, Aristotle said, nature abhors a vacuum. And so many of us think of vacuum incorrectly, wrongly. So before we talk about vacuum, we need to talk a little bit about air, because in fact, vacuum is the absence of air at some level. So what is air? I need some help from the audience. What is air? Yeah. It's a gas. It's a mixture of gases. Uh, what is air made out of? Nitrogen, oxygen, water vapor. There's the actual standard atmosphere for any of you who happen to be interested. And the water vapor varies. Today, it's, or yesterday it was really high. This afternoon it's supposed to be low and delightful. And why is air important? You need it to breathe. What else? How about combustion? How about hearing? We'll give you a demonstration of why you need air for hearing as well. Does air have weight? Sure, air has weight. How much does it weigh? Does air push down on you? How much is it pushing down on you? One atmosphere, 14.7 pounds per square inch. Did somebody give it to me in metric? 760 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the answer that I'm going to use right now is 14.7 pounds per square inch. PSI is the abbreviation. It's also one kilogram per square centimeter. If you use European units, it's also one bar or 101 kilopascals. Um, just to give you an idea of what that is, we talk about 14.7 PSI without much, or rather glibly. This is 14 pounds of water in this jug. This is one cub cubic inch. So every square inch of our bodies, take a pick a side, it doesn't make any difference, that much weight is being pressed down on us. I could pass this around, but it's kind of awkward in this uh, audience uh, or this seating, so I'll just leave it there. So it's basically two gallons of water on every uh, inch cube, each square inch. So air does push down on you. If it's pushing down at 14.7 PSI, the pressure on this piece of paper, 1,375 pounds. That doesn't make sense. It pushes down on us, but it also pushes sideways, and it pushes up on us as well. Blaise Pascal in the 1600s prescribed generated the principle named after him that a fluid, either a liquid or gas, pushes equally in all directions. So there's 14.7 PSI pressing down, but there's also 14.7 PSI pressing up. That's why we're not all crushed, and that's why I can hold this piece of paper without any difficulty. But in fact, you can show that it's pushing sideways. If you hold it gently and pull it, it'll take it right out of your hands. So there is air pushing in all directions on us, and that's important. How about a vacuum? How are we going to define a vacuum? I'm not going to leave that to you to define. I'm going to define it as any volume, which is at a lower pressure than the atmosphere. Could be a high vacuum, low vacuum, anything in between. A familiar vacuum effect is the inner ear pressure you feel going up in airplanes or elevators up or down. It's because the air pressure outside is changing faster than the air pressure in your inner ear, and you feel that pressure. Pressure differences are also vacuum differences by our definition of vacuum today. So a vacuum. I contend that it's the first activity that you perform on your own. You inhaled as soon as you came out of your mother's womb, and that's a generating a vacuum by expanding your chest cavity and drawing air in from the atmosphere, your first breath. Drinking through a straw is a vacuum phenomenon. I'll show that in a minute. Water pumps are, use vacuum. Atmospheric pressure, 14.7 PSI. We've talked about that, one kilogram per square centimeter. There are some other units there, 760 millimeters of mercury. We heard about that. 
30 inches of mercury, 30, almost 34 feet of water, just because water is less dense than mercury or 10 meters. One of the interesting things, we talk about atmospheric pressure. Pressure is a force per unit area, but here we have units of length to describe a pressure. That comes from a barometer, which was invented back in the 1600s. We'll talk about that story in just a minute. Remember, Aristotle said, nature abhors a vacuum. So we're gonna, we have a story about Galileo and Torricelli that introduced the barometer. About 300 BC, Aristotle deduced that a vacuum was impossible. Remember, Aristotle did science at a time when experiments you just don't do experiments. It's what you deduce by thinking. For many years, scientists followed Aristotle's lead, agreeing that a vacuum could not exist. Nevertheless, craftsmen demonstrated pumps that use vacuum in spite of these views. So science doesn't always get it right. These pumps consisted of a tube with a movable disk inside. When the disk was withdrawn, water flowed into the tube. If the water did not flow into the tube, Aristotle's forbidden vacuum would have formed. So far, everything's still consistent. But in the 1600s, Galileo learned an interesting thing from workmen about these water pumps. They displayed a peculiar weakness. They could raise water to about 10 meters, 30 feet, but no more. Galileo found it curious that nature should have a horror vacuum for 10 meters and then simply stop. He assigned this problem to his new assistant. Uh, unfortunately, Galileo died very shortly thereafter, but that did not stop his assistant, Torricelli, from producing a vacuum using what we now call a mercury barometer. This was the first demonstration of vacuum known to science. I just want to demonstrate how a water pump works in case you haven't thought about it. It works the same way as a syringe. I have some uh, cola beverage here. If there's a Basically, there's a cylinder inside the tube, and you know how it works, but I just want to demonstrate it when I pull up on the cylinder. Oops, let you see it there. It draws the beverage into the syringe, just like a water pump does, except the water pumps may be larger or more automated. So here's a Torricelli barometer. You take a glass tube, has to be longer than 760 millimeters, fill it up with mercury, put your thumb over it, turn it upside down so the open end is underneath the surface of the mercury, take your thumb away, and the weight of the, atmos oops, the, weight of the atmosphere presses down on the pool of mercury here, and the atmospheric pressure supports just 760 millimeters of mercury. If you do the math, the weight of the mercury in that glass tube is exactly 14.7 pounds for every square inch of cross section of the tube. So that's the atmospheric pressure which is supporting the mercury in the tube. And this is the basis of measuring vacuum levels in length units. So 760 millimeters is one atmospheric pressure. Just to make sure we Make it very clear, I've got a straw here. I can draw the beverage into my mouth. I just said that incorrectly. We say that commonly, don't we? We say we sucked on the straw. We create a partial vacuum and atmospheric pressure does all the work of forcing the liquid up at the straw into my mouth. If you do that, on the shuttle, it doesn't work, or the space station, we don't have a shuttle anymore. On space station, it doesn't work because there's not enough gravity to force the fluid back up the straw. It's atmospheric pressure, just like in the barometer, that's letting the liquid, forcing the liquid up into the straw. Torricelli said it very well, we live submerged at the bottom of an ocean of elementary air, which is known by incontestable experiments to have weight. This was back in the 1600s. As an aside, Torricelli also gave the first scientific description of the cause of wind. He said that winds are produced by differences of air temperature and hence density between two regions of the earth. 
Air pressure is caused by the weight of the air pressing down on the Earth. Earth's gravity causes the downward force we know of as weight, and the measured pressure obviously therefore depends on the amount of air above the point at which we're making the measurement. So a question, what would happen if I carried a barometer up a mountain? I hope for this audience most of you know, Pascal did that experiment back in the 1600s. In fact, he was smart enough to have his brother-in-law carry the do the hard work of carrying the barometer. It actually carried three barometers up the mountain in case they made multiple measurements, doing good science, doing experimental science at the time. And of course, three mercury barometers weighed a bit, so uh, his pas Pascal stayed down here at the bottom. And as you go from sea level, where the atmospheric pressure plus or minus is 760 millimeter, depending on the weather outside, as you go up the mountain, as you suspect, the pressure decreases until at the top of a 3,000 meter mountain, the pressure is dropped to 690 millimeters. And that's simply because the atmospheric pressure is lower, not as much air, not as much weight to push down on the mercury so the measured barometric pressure is lower. What I find remarkable about, about that, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have telephones. This was done five years after Torricelli's barometer was invented. Remarkable progress, in a different country, by the way. So again, that, just to reemphasize that, the straw and the orange soda or the cola, the pressure exerted on the surface of the cola reservoir by the atmosphere is what supports the weight of the column of soda in the straw. It's not, I'm not actually doing the work. It's the atmosphere that's doing the work. So I want to introduce my vacuum system to you real quickly. Um, we have it here. It's a vacuum pump donated by Varian. We thank them for that. I have an, a switch to turn the pump on and off here, and I have a valve here which I can either connect to atmosphere here to vent the system or to the, the gauge and to the plumbing here. And so I'm going to do a quick demonstration. This is just a water bottle. Talk about recycling these days. I'll turn my vacuum pump on. This gives you a readout of an approximate pressure. It's good as it up here where the uh, vacuum pressure isn't too high, and this gives us a better reading when we get low. It's not calibrated this morning. I apologize for that. It should read 760 millimeters. It usually does. So when I open the valve to let the pump connect to the bottle, that's an expensive way of crushing a bottle, but it works very well, and we can release it. So you could think about that as a new recycling technique if you like. But what's happening there is the atmosphere is crushing the bottle, right? We remove the air from the inside so the pressure inside is lower and the atmosphere crushes the bottle. If I did this in space with a vacuum around it already or no gravity, nothing would have happened because there's no force around the, the bottle. It's important to note that the pressure exerted on the surface of the urn soda by the atmosphere supports the weight of the column. So even if I formed a perfect vacuum, atmospheric pressure can only push the urn soda to about 10 meters, 34 feet. This is because the column of water that high exerts the same pressure as the gas molecules in our atmosphere. That's why the craftsman told Galileo, or Galileo found out, that water pumps only work to about 10 meters. So that's as, as much as the atmosphere can do. I have some suction cups here. By now you should be able to tell me how suction cups work. We have atmospheric pressure on either side of these suction cups. In order to pull them apart, I have to create a vacuum inside, as long as the seal on the edges works, right? I know what the size of these suction cups is. You need 110 pounds of force to pull these apart. Only one attendee has ever pulled them apart. I'll give you, I'll, you can pass it around just to demonstrate what that feels like. I don't give out notes for this course. In fact, if you're interested and you leave me an email address, I'll send you a PDF of all the presentation slides. But I do that because this is more of a demonstration, a performance rather than a class. 
And Socrates said it well, education is the kindling of a flame, not the filling of a vessel. I want to get you excited about the concepts, get you appreciate the concepts, rather than just have you take copious notes and everything. But if you are taking notes, know that you can have a copy of the presentation later. Another guy from back a ways was Otto von Guericke. He was the mayor of Magdeburg in Germany back in the days when politicians were also scientists and philosophers and inventors. And he invented the first vacuum pump. His major scientific achievement was the establishment of the physics of a vacuum. And here's an etching portraying one of his demonstrations. He took two copper hemispheres, was able to build a seal made out of leather. Think about that these days for anybody who are in vacuum technology. And with, <clears throat> with his vacuum pump, he evacuated the chamber well enough and the cylinders were, or hemispheres were large enough so teams of eight horses pulling on either side could not pull the hemispheres apart just due to the vacuum inside, or rather, the air pressure outside forcing the, the spheres together. This was done 14 years after Torricelli's barometer. Again, amazing communication back then. We have a modern version of the Magdeburg hemispheres. We don't have horses here, and so we can use a smaller one. It's just two aluminum hemispheres. There's a rubber O-ring seal on one of them. If I evacuate the chamber by connecting this, the valve to the vacuum pump, I have to open this valve and open this valve. Oops, it is open. And let it pump down a little bit. That should be good enough. I can close this valve. And this one, and now there's, can't pull it apart. There's a couple hundred pounds of force would be needed to pull these apart. But as soon as, that, because air pressure is forcing them together, as soon as I let air into the chamber, no force at all. So I'm hoping I'm convincing you that it's air pressure is doing all of this work for us. And this is just a demonstration of a, uh, on a small scale of a historic model. So atmospheric pressure, the air around us exerts a pressure on everything. Um, got several demonstrations I wanted to show you. Let's see, yes. So we're going to do this one again, except I'll do it more carefully, and I hope, hopefully you'll be able to see something here. We're going to use the atmosphere to draw or force this rubber sheet down the tube, I can pull it down a little bit by shutting off the vacuum. So I remove, reduce the pressure a little bit there. If I pull it down more, it goes further. And finally, depending on how it, it, will, it will pop most of the time. So it's just air pressure pushing down on the rubber sheet, when it fails, it's actually a sonic, small sonic boom because the rubber relaxes or comes back to its position faster than the speed of sound, and you hear that snap, which is really a, a, a small sonic boom. Most of you know what bubble wrap is. I've cut up some small pieces of bubble wrap. I'm going to put them inside my vacuum chamber here. This is the first demonstration of my transparent vacuum chamber. And I have to do a little plumbing here because I only have one pump. So by now, we should hopefully have an appreciation for what's going to go on inside the vacuum chamber. These are little plastic balls of air. As we reduce the pressure around them, the air inside will uh, expand. And some of them will pop, I think. You can see them expanding. Like popcorn. We'll talk about popcorn a little bit. And that's just the air rushing back into the chamber. And we'll get rid of these guys, get them out of the way. I also have a pair of suction cups here, just like the ones that were passed around. 
what's going to happen now if I put these suction cups in the vacuum system and pull the vacuum on it? Let's see if I can get this set up properly. If we remove the atmospheric pressure forcing the suction cups together, they should come apart. Takes a little while for the pressure to come down. I can see that the suction cups are expanding a little bit. By removing the air pressure, basically the suction of the suction cups disappears. Maybe I have to shake it a little bit. There, they came apart. So a lot of the things we take for granted, uh, I hope, are illuminated better now. And again, just to reinforce one more time, if I draw on the straw, atmospheric pressure is doing the work. There's no such thing as suction. So the air exerts a pressure on everything around us, also partly determines the weather barometric pressure and atmospheric pressure with the weather and the wind and forces. This is basically an aside. Differences in air pressure cause wind. Air at high pressure moves to regions of lower pressure. Hurricane force winds are greater than 75 miles an hour or 120 kilometers per hour. This can occur when the differences in pressure are about two inches or five centimeters of mercury. For an example, Hurricane Katrina 2005 devastated southwestern Louisiana and Mississippi with winds up, up to 120 miles per hour, and the barometric pressure difference causing those winds was only 2.7 inches of mercury. That's because small differences in pressure over very large areas can generate enormous forces. So we've talked about taking a barometer up a mountain and recognizing that the pressure goes down as you go up in altitude. And so here we've plotted, or did not plotted, but given you a table. So at sea level, we have 14.7 PSI. I labeled that 100%. If you go to Denver at 5,000 feet, the next line, that's about 83% of the atmospheric pressures we have at sea level. The first time I did this presentation, we were at, did it in Denver. And my wife and I hiked the day before in the mountains and got up to over 10,000 feet where there's 69% of the air pressure. So I was worried that my legs wouldn't take me up the mountains. My legs were fine. My lungs were not fine because I had to take four breaths to get the same amount of air as I would get in three breaths at sea level. And so it's just that kind of work. And if you go to the top of Everest, just under 30,000 feet, there's only 29% of the amount of air there as it is at atmospheric pressure. And that's why most ascents of Everest have oxygen assist. It's just like carrying a barometer up a mountain. The pressure goes down as the altitude goes up. We can plot those numbers. In fact, this is a plot of exactly those numbers. The altitude in feet at the bottom of the graph, the altitude in meters at the top, in case you uh, live in a metric world. And here's the relative pressure being plotted from 100% uh, down to something like 30-some percent. And if we can, we can extend that to almost any altitude we want, and that's what the pressure looks like as we go up in altitude. So where is the end of the atmosphere? It's kind of arbitrary, but many people say it's at about 35,000 feet, uh, six and a half miles up, just where a lot of jets uh, tend to, to glide through. To give you an idea, we are, we are very dependent on that atmosphere. We think of it as going on forever. But here's some images from NASA of the, our globe. The size of the atmosphere, that's 35,000 feet, the bar on the plot there is 100 times the, the height of our atmosphere. That little speck is 10 times the height of our atmosphere. So while we think of the atmosphere as being going up forever, it's a very small fraction of our world. Only a quarter percent of the Earth's volume is its atmosphere. We are dependent on that atmosphere for breathing combustion and hearing, as we said earlier. 
the boiling point of water changes with pressure because the boiling point definition is where the uh, vapor pressure of the liquid is the same as atmospheric pressure. So the boiling point in, in Fahrenheit on the right side of the curve, a plot, the boiling point in centigrade units on the left side, and the pressure across the bottom. So what you see is at 760 torr atmospheric pressure, the boiling point is a familiar 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees Celsius centigrade. But if we go a mile high in Denver, the pressure is lower, so it takes a lower temperature to raise the, the, the vapor pressure of the water to get to the atmospheric pressure. And so the, the boiling point is something like 204 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 96 to 95, 96 degrees Celsius. If you go hiking in the mountains, it's still lower. Reducing the pressure reduces the boiling point. So what happens if you're cooking potatoes or rice or beans in boiling water in Denver? What do you have to do? The boiling point is lower. You, take, you have to cook it longer. This is the same data, exactly the same. I've just switched the axes. So now I have temperature along the x-axis and vapor pressure along the y-axis going up. And again, at 760 torr, we have 212 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm doing this very deliberately. And we can see that it comes down just as we showed on the previous slide. Uh, as we go to lower pressure, the boiling point goes down. Now I'm going to do a mathematical trick. And I'm going to change the, the axes to logarithmic axes. If, oops, I have one point here is the boiling point definition. It's the temperature where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure pressure. I'm going to change the axes to logarithmic. If you know logarithmic uh, mathematics, you don't need an explanation. If you don't know it, my explanation isn't, I don't have enough time to explain it. But basically, it allows us to compress the axes dramatically. So this is exactly the same data, except now on a logarithmic axis. So this is 760 right there. And this is uh, 200 right there. So that's that point on the end. And I do this deliberately because I'm going to shrink it again so that there's three decades of pressure here and two decades of temperature here. And that's the same data up there now compressed still more. And you say, why am I doing this? Is because later on in the presentation, we're going to look at a lot of slides or several slides with lots of data that have curves that look like this. These are vapor pressure curves of gases in the elements. And we see that they're going to be important for some of the things we want to understand. And this is just to give you an introduction to where those curves come from. We'll take a look at those later. So when we think about high altitude baking, these brownies were very good. We baked them at atmospheric pressure. But on the back of the package, it says uh, high altitude. There it is in circle. And that's what it says right there. It, it change, you change the recipe for high altitude baking. Uh, you basically add flour and more water to make the dough tougher. Because you don't want it to be a cake with the bubbles of gas being large. You want it to be a brownie with very small, finer texture. And if you don't make the batter tougher, you'll get larger bubbles because you're at lower pressure in Denver than you are at atmospheric pressure. We can demonstrate that. Uh, Marshmallow Man here will give up his life for this demonstration. Um, we'll put him in the vacuum chamber. And recognize, of course, that marshmallows are just uh, sugar and gelatin formed into uh, bubbles. And so if we uh, turn on the vacuum pump, and evacuate the chamber, those bubbles will expand. And they'll keep expanding until the bubbles start to collapse. Oops, he's fell over. And then it'll actually start shrinking because some of the bubbles will collapse. But of course, if I let the atmosphere back in, they collapse more dramatically. And you're a very sophisticated audience. If I do this with kids, and I've done this many times with kids, they all want the crushed marshmallows to see if they taste different. They don't, but there you go. <laughs> They're just more concentrated sweetness. And we can do the same thing with shaving cream as well. Shaving cream is just bubbles of soap. 
So by now you should have an appreciation already for what's going to happen. The bubbles of soap will expand. And I could let this go, but it'll make a mess in my vacuum chamber. So I'll let it go for a little bit. And it will, if I really let this go, it'll keep growing and spill over. So I'm just going to stop it. I think you've got the point. Vacuum thin films, finally getting to where we're doing this. We make films of metals typically or metal oxides. Historically, metals were more important. These days, metal oxides are also very important. And we do those for their electrical, optical, and barrier characteristics. These metal or these vacuum deposited films are very thin. We preserve the mechanical strength of the substrate very often and add electrical op or adjust the electrical, optical, or barrier characteristics. So these are some vacuum thin films. Uh, types of coatings on the left and applications on the right. You can take a look at that. I'm not going to read that to you, but while you're looking at that, I'm going to plug a heater in that I need for a later demonstration. I think that's the right one. Yeah, should be good. Lots of applications for vacuum thin films. Uh, they're actually quite ubiquitous, although many of us are not aware of them particularly. And why do we make vacuum thin films in the first place? to make a profit. This, of course, is done in academia as well, but most of the films that are made are for profit. The next section of the presentation is going to talk about extremes. We're going to talk about extremes in length, going very small, thin films. We're going to talk about extremes in pressure, going very low to get the pressures we need for vacuum coating. And we're going to talk about extremes in temperature, both very high and very low, for very different purposes. But before we talk about extremes in these kinds of numbers, let's talk about something that we're all really familiar with. Let's first talk about money. Because there's an important lesson here. A dozen eggs might be a, a buck these days. A digital camera, if you don't have one on your cell phone, might be a couple hundred bucks. And here I've introduced scientific notation. So I've written 200 as 2 times 10 to the 2. That just means $2 times 10 times 10. I hope you understand that. That equals 200. A car is $20,000. And then I've left a gap there to the CEO's salary of $2 million. I understand $2. I understand $200. I even understand $20,000. $2 million, I don't understand. Uh, Walmart sales in 2009 were $401 trillion. I don't understand that number. Uh, the US GDP is 1.4 times 10 to the 13th. I don't understand that number either. I think that's common to most of us. There's a range of numbers that we're familiar with, the sizes, and we're comfortable with those. When we get very large or very small, hmm, it's hard to think about them. If you're, used, if you're an economist, if you're Bernanke, you understand these numbers because you use them every day. But if you're not using them every day, they're pretty foreign. But not only are they very large or very small as a problem, but they're all the different units make it even worse. And by the way, in vacuum, we have lots of different systems of units to make it, it's not made to make it confusing. It's just historically, that's the way it happened. If we talk about extremes in length getting larger, I'm good, oops, I'm good down to about this break point here. A walk around my lake is four miles. I know what four miles is. I know what the length of my hand is, the length of my foot, a meter, a mile. But when we talk about the diameter of the Earth or the distance of the sun or the size of the Milky Way, I just don't use those often enough to be comfortable with them, familiar with them. And we'll see the same things as we go smaller. So it, this copy paper, 20 weight paper, is four thousandths of an inch thick, a hundredth or yeah, ten thousandth of a meter, one times ten to the minus four meters. So here's, again, scientific notation where we got to move the decimal point four times in the other direction or divide by ten thousand. That's also a hundred micrometers, and that's something that I'm going to introduce here. Uh, a micrometer is ten to the minus six, oops, of a meter, and uh, that's a number that's often used in thin film coating. A human hair, for example, is anywhere from a mil to eight 
uh, mils thick, eight, one to eight thousandths thick. Facial tissue is smaller. But as you get the, again across that break in the middle of the slide, those are numbers that dimensions I just am not as familiar with, not as comfortable with. A thick vacuum coating might be five microns thick. Uh, my ophthalmic lenses here are, have anti-reflection coatings. The typical thickness for those is about a uh, 100 nanometers thick, as il illustrated right there. A nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 of a meter. So divide by uh, a, a billion to get up from a meter to a nanometer. And that's a, maybe a typical thin film dimension for optical applications. For a snack food packaging application like potato chip bags, the aluminum coating on there is about 35 nanometers thick, much thinner. To give you, in some perspective, an atomic diameter is something like two-tenths of a nanometer. So uh, very, very small. Again, those of us who play in the vacuum coating field have an appreciation for lots of those numbers, but I contend that most of us only have a, a working knowledge of them. We really don't have a sense for how very small they are. To give you a better idea, this is a this yellow circle there is a cartoon of an expanded human hair. Uh, it's 50 microns in diameter. So here's a, what a five micron disc would look like. Here's what a hundred and one little pixel in the image is about 120 uh, nanometers diameter if this is a 50 micron uh, diameter. A different way of looking at it is smaller by thousands. Here's a mountain out in Glacier Park. It's actually higher than 3,000 meters, um, but the distance from the water level to the top of the peak is about 3,000 meters. This is my nephew a couple years ago. He's a meter high at that time, a thousand times smaller than the height of the mountain. Rice, the width of a grain of rice is about a millimeter a thousand times smaller than the height of my nephew. Yeast to make bread and beer is about a micron. Again, a thousand times smaller than a grain, a width of a grain of rice. And a sugar molecule, one nanometer, is a thousand times smaller than that yeast particle. Or a million times smaller than the grain of rice, a trillion times small, billion times smaller than that my nephew. And those are the kinds of dimensions that we talk about when we talk about vacuum thin film coating. We've talked about air pressure in various situations going up in elevation. Uh, we talked about breathing. Uh, breathing turns out to you don't need much uh, change in pressure to fill your lungs. It's only a difference in pressure of about 20 torr, typically, unless you're really breathing hard. I sucked on a vacuum gauge one time and got it down to 500 torr. I'm told that their people could get down to 300. I have not, I've not been able to do that. Maybe a horn player, I'm not sure. Octopus's tentacles, because they're like suction cups, can get to something like 100 torr and have enormous forces. We can go, of course, a lot lower, and so we do. A mechanical vacuum pump, oh, I should say a vacuum cleaner, typical vacuum cleaners, not much of a vacuum at all, 600 torr. Uh, mechanical vacuum pump that we use commonly in the laboratory in production, 10 to the minus 2. If you go to where the International Space Station is, the pressure is down to 10 to the minus 6 of a tor. On the moon, it's still lower. Interstellar space is still lower yet. But we can, in the laboratory, we can actually get lower pressures, higher vacuums than we can get in interstellar space. So we talk about space being empty. We can actually make space which is still emptier in the laboratory. And of course, it's not empty. We're going to talk about making coatings. And one of the major ways of making coatings is by evaporation. And that consists of a four-step process, melting, evaporation, condensation, and freezing. We'll talk about all of those. A curious question, have you boiled any ice cubes lately? I want to use water as a prototype because water is one of the few compounds that exists that we're familiar with with all three phases, solid, liquid, and a gas. So here's the, uh, some data about water, ice, and steam. If you have a one gram of ice at zero degrees C or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the, that's the melting point, you have to add something like 80 calories for every gram of water to get it to melt. Doesn't change temperature, just going from solid 
to liquid. Most of many of you know that. Take another 100 calories, and it raises the temperature from zero degrees, the melting point, to the boiling point, or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And then it takes an enormous amount of energy to convert it at the same temperature to steam, to a vapor or gas. And one gram of water is just one cubic centimeter. And here's a cubic centimeter. I cut this block out to be a cubic centimeter on each, or a centimeter on each side just to give you an idea of that. But one of the reasons it takes so much energy to, to boil the water here is because that one cubic centimeter expands to 1,500 cubic centimeters as a vapor. And so that's, that, that expansion is what takes up much of the energy. Oops. And one of the reasons vacuum scientists care so much about water is because if I take that one and a half liters, 1,500 centimeters of vapor at atmospheric pressure, and take it down in my vacuum system, every time I reduce the pressure by a factor of 10, the volume increases by a factor of 10. <clears throat> so at a typical uh, vacuum coating pressure of 10 to the minus 4 torr, that one gram of water is now 10 million liters. All of that has to be removed from our vacuum system if we put it in at atmospheric pressure. <clears throat> and I'll show you systems where we put tons of water in. It can be a problem. Just to give you a demonstration of this, too, by the way, uh, I've, I've showed what happens as you add energy. The same thing happens when you go in the reverse direction. As you steam condenses to form water, it gives up 540 calories. That's its condensation energy. So when you get out of the water at the, at the beach on a breezy day, low humidity, the water on your skin isn't 100 degrees C, but it evaporates and you get all of that cooling on your skin due to the evaporation of the water. If you stick your finger into the steam coming out of a teapot, it's not the fact that it's 100 degrees C that it burns. It's that it's giving up all of this energy to your skin as you stick it into the spout. You can demonstrate that real quickly without any danger. If you blow across the back of your hand, it feels warm. If you lick the back of your other hand and blow across it, it feels cool. Because water is evaporating. It's warm because the, my breath is at my body temperature. It's evaporating here and it feels cooler. You can do that with your kids as well. And they can get an appreciation for that too. So for vacuum thin film deposition, we simply take a material as a, typically as a solid, think ice for water as our prototype, change it to a gas, think steam, transport that material as a gas to another surface. Typically, it's our substrate that we want to be coating, but it also, we'll find out, coats everything else in proximity as well. That gas condenses onto the substrate, giving up its condensation energy. Uh, it forms as a thin layer, think water, and then it freezes as a thin layer into a solid film. And so if we're boiling here now. Just, let me just, I have a, uh, pop bottle here filled with water on a heater. It's just starting to boil. We may be able to see this, but I have a silver spoon here. If I hold it over the, you can imagine what's happening. We get water condensing on the spoon. That's exactly what happens inside our vacuum systems. We form a vapor of a material we want to coat, put something in there that we want to have coated, and it condenses on it. It's no more magic than that. Think about vapor pressure. Anybody have a pressure cooker at home? We certainly do. The reason pressure cookers work, if there's a sealed chamber, you put water in, put it on the heat, you get higher temperature. Then you can get the water above 212 degrees Fahrenheit or 100 degrees C because you have high pressure inside the cooker and you can cook things in moist heat and at higher temperatures so you can cook them faster. Think about the sense of smell, the vapor pressure. We can't smell solids or liquids. The only things we smell are gases and vapors. Smell is more intense at high temperatures. Think frozen beef versus grilled beef. I can't smell that one, but I certainly can smell that one. I actually made those a couple days ago. Uh, high temperature means high vapor pressure and relates to the sense of smell as well. 
And you can boil nearly everything, but for many things, you need a vacuum system because as we reduce the pressure, we reduce the temperature of the boiling point. Remember, the boiling point definition is the temperature when the vapor pressure equals atmospheric uh, pressure. So as we reduce the pressure in the chamber, the boiling point actually decreases. And we'll do a demonstration of that here. I think we're, we'll do this one right now. Uh, well, I'm going to turn this can over. It's filled with boiling water now so that all the gas in the can should be steam, and hopefully the steam will condense as we tip it over into this uh, pan of cool water. So again, I got rid of all the air in the, chain, in the can because I was boiling water. As soon as the water, as soon as the vapor, the gas steam inside the can was cooled, it reduced the pressure because it condensed into vapor, into gas, or to a liquid rather, and then the air pressure around it collapsed the, the can. If you want to do this for your kids at home, make sure you have it boiling really well because if it's half full of air and half full of water vapor, nothing happens. So I put, yeah, I just put a half an inch of water in the bottom of the can, get it boiling so the can is filled with water vapor. So if you fill it up too high with, with water, there's not enough volume to shrink to collapse the can. So we're going to boil some HFE. This is a 3M audience. Most of you know what HFE is, hydrofluoroethers. But it's a, it's a solvent that's non-flammable and uh, non-toxic. And we're going to put its room temperature. It's just been sitting out here. I'm going to just confirm that it's room temperature. Nothing magic here. And we will boil this fluid simply by reducing the pressure to give some appreciation for the fact that reducing the pressure reduces the boiling point. Its normal boiling point, I think, is around 54 Celsius. There it is starting to bubble. I can see bubbles forming. I'll let it go a little bit longer, lest we fill up the, the chamber as it burps a little. Oop, there we did it. <laughs> Luckily, it's not, as I said, it's not toxic. and. Uh, not flammable either. Let me just put this back into a container so I don't lose all of it. So remember that the vapor pressure of water versus temperature, we showed you this plot before, used that to introduce you to it. Uh, we want to look at the vapor pressure, the elements versus temperature, and here's a whole lot of data. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, uh, excise most of that, but to just highlight one or two of them, there's zinc. And what you can see is its vapor pressure here on the left side in millimeters of mercury or tor on the right side in, in bar or atmospheres. And at the temperatures, this little circle here is the melting point. But we need, for vacuum deposition, we typically need uh, pressures of 10 to the minus 4 tor vapor pressure to get a coating to operate well. Let me turn off this pump. And as you can see, as we raise the temperature along the x-axis, the vapor pressure goes up dramatically from starting at 10 to the minus 7 all the way up to 1 tor. And it turns out zinc was one of the first materials ever evaporated in a vacuum system because it had a very low temperature at which you could get a good vapor pressure. Aluminum is ubiquitous for snack food packaging, and you can see it here. Uh, this curve comes up and gets to 10 to the minus 4 tor at something like 1,000 to 1,100 degrees uh, centigrade. And that's a pretty typical for a laboratory system operation. We're going to talk about some extremes in temperature going towards the hot end of the spectrum. I've never seen minus 40 C or F, but they're the same on the scale. Uh, even in Minnesota and Wisconsin here, that's lower than I've seen. We all know that 32 degrees F and 0 degrees C is the melting point or freezing point of water. 
uh, 120F or 50 degrees C is an outdoor temperature on a thermometer, sort of the limit that I have on my thermometer at home, and that's thankfully higher than I've ever seen. Uh, if you turn on the electric, an electric stove top, you can, on low, you can get something like 200 degrees, 260 degrees F. You can feel heat over it, but you don't see any light coming off of it. So it's no sense, you can, there's sensible heat, but no glow. It takes something like 1,000 or 1,300 degrees F, 1,000 degrees Kelvin to see a red glow. You gotta get a lot hotter to get the yellow glow as in a steel furnace. And inside of a light bulb, something like 4,600 degrees Fahrenheit, 2,500 degrees Kelvin. And of course, the surface of the sun is even hotter. We'll see why uh, numbers like this, the temperature of a light bulb is important in just a moment right here. Here's a, another set of data at higher temperatures than the one we previously showed. And I've added some arrows to give you an indication of the regimes where you see red heat or yellow heat or white heat. And here's silver, common material for evaporation. Aluminum, again, we saw before. Again, we get up to about 1,100 degrees C with aluminum. Let's see, follow that line up right there to get 10 to the minus 4 torr pressure. That's still vapor pressure. That's still not yellow heat for the most part. Who knows what Edison's first light bulb filaments were made out of? Anybody guess? Remember? They were made out of carbon filaments, various threads that he carburized. Uh, there's copper, gold, other things. And the reason is carbon is way up here. So you can heat it up to get white heat out of it and still have the vapor pressure low enough so that it doesn't vaporize instantly. If you tried to do that with aluminum, uh, it's still only yellow heat and it's already vaporized completely. That's why you don't see aluminum filaments in light bulbs. It wasn't for a few years later that tungsten filaments were first demonstrated for light bulbs. And it's clear from this chart why tungsten is preferred, and that is it takes much higher temperatures before it gets to a vapor pressure in which it'll evaporate. And so you can get white heat efficiently from a tungsten filament without it evaporating. So it lives longer than you can with a graphite or carbon filament. And I have a light bulb here somewhere. I'm looking right at it. I bought a clear one so you could see. You can come up and take a look at it. It's got a fine filament inside of it. And uh, it's just a tungsten filament wound into a helix so it can uh, have more surface area for that heat. As an aside, a light bulb operates at about 2,500 degrees Celsius, 2,800 Kelvin. Gives off about 6 watts of the 60 watts that we put into it as light. All the rest of it is heat. That's why we're replacing incandescent bulbs with fluorescents because, and LEDs because they give off more of the energy we put in with as light and less as heat. To compare that, a 60-watt candle operates at lower temperature, only gets off about 3 watts of heat, or excuse me, 3 watts of light and 57 watts of heat. So if you want heat, a candle's good, but if you want light, uh, stick with incandescents and fluorescents preferred. The efficiency of an incandescent bulb would increase with higher temperature, but it would burn up much more rapidly. To give you a real sense of how important vacuum is for developing the vapor pressures of these various materials, here's the melting point of aluminum in various uh, units of temperature, any one you can prefer, Celsius, Kelvin, or Fahrenheit. Here's the boiling point at 760 torr atmospheric pressure. But if we go to 10 to the minus 4 torr, the boiling point drops by almost a factor of two, or a little more than a factor of two on the Kelvin absolute scale. Makes it a lot easier to vaporize simply by reducing the pressure. You can boil nearly anything, but for most things, you need a vacuum system, particularly metals. Again, the many states of water coming back to this, I just wanted to emphasize again. There's a demonstration that I used to do here uh, that I'm not going to do today because the, the pump just won't give me what we need. Um, but this is to take a container of water that I would ordinarily have it sitting in ice. So it's at zero degrees C, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Put it inside the chamber, draw a vacuum on it, and just like the solvent boils, it would start boiling at 32 degrees C. But remember, this 
change in state here from a vapor on the right-hand side of the plot to a liquid takes energy. And so for every gram of water that evaporates, it leaves, takes away 300, 540 calories of energy. So what happens is this liquid in the chamber goes, boils at 32 degrees C and then freezes. It goes from boiling to freezing in one step. It's a cool demonstration. I need a bigger pump. That one's heavy enough. So if you... I'll show you. The question is, what's the pressure? I'll show you in just a minute. If you want to think more about this, just search boil water vacuum, and Google will come up. The first couple citations will give you a demonstration of that. Here's the vapor pressure of water. Uh, as a, at 100 degrees C, the vapor pressure is atmospheric pressure. Uh, you can't read it down here, so I multiplied by 10. So in order to get uh, the vapor pressure here down at 0 degrees C, which is the freezing point, it's about 4. Uh, oops, I think it's 4.6 torr. So you've got to get a pump that can go below 4.6 torr, but have also good pumping speed, and you can freeze that boiling water instantly. How about popcorn? Anybody like popcorn at the movies? What are these? These are the ones that don't pop. What's going on with popcorn? Basically, it's a liquid to vapor transition. You heat up the popcorn, the hull, or the pericarp, as the biologists talk about it, holds in the steam created when the flesh, 14% water or so, heats up. The kernels pop at about 350C, 100, or 350F, 175C. That's a pressure of nine atmospheres. So as you heat up the kernel, the pressure is rising and rising and rising until the hull can't hold it anymore, and it explodes. These are ones that are leaky hulls. If you take good popcorn and prick them each with a needle, you'll get all of these. Don't, don't do that. Also, if you leave your popcorn sitting on the shelf for months and it dries out, it also doesn't pop. You've probably also experienced that because there's not enough water left to build up the pressure to get it there. This is an image of a resort that I used to go to in Tulum, Mexico. It was one of my favorites. Uh, it's on the Caribbean. It's always pleasant weather there because of all of the moisture. Think about water vapor. When the temperature starts rising during the day, all the moisture that's surrounding this place evaporates. Not all of it, but some of it does. For every gram that evaporates, 540 calories of cooling left behind. At night, when things want to start to cool off, doesn't cool off very much because the water condenses out of the atmosphere and warms things back up again. So it's always moderate temperatures there. What's the first thing you think about when you go into a desert? What, what characterizes a desert? Dry and hot. Both that that's typical response when I ask what happens in a desert. Dry and hot. Deserts are dry. They happen to be hot during the daytime when the sun is out because there's no moisture to take. For every gram of moisture, you get 540 calories taken away every time a gram vaporizes. With no moisture, there's no way to moderate the temperature. But at night, deserts are cold because there's no moisture to condense and keep the, pressure, the temperature up. That's why on a day with high humidity in Minnesota and Wisconsin, the overnight temperature only went down to 70-something last night because of the high humidity. You've got to get dry to get low temperature. So deserts are dry, hot during the daytime, and cold at night. How about snow caves? Any winter campers here? The trick in a snow cave is to build a, a cave underneath the snow with an opening below the space in which you want to be uh, sleeping overnight or staying during the day. And because... The moisture you give off in your body condenses on the side of the cave, inside of the cave. If you don't have a lot of air exchange with the outside, the temperature in your snow cave will be 32 degrees Fahrenheit, no matter what the temperature is outside, just because of the exchange of moisture between vapor and solid. 
Again, this is many, the many states of water. At this end, we have water, the stream, that controls the temperature in tropical beaches and deserts. And at this end, uh, solid to liquid. Liquid to solid controls the temperature in a snow cave, for example. So again, going back to vacuum thin film deposition, we take a material in one form, solid, convert it to a gas, transport the material to another surface, the substrate, condense it, and form a solid film. That's often done as one step. It goes from a gas to a solid in a single step. The essential features, the essential equipment that you need for evaporation is a vacuum chamber. We need a vacuum pump to remove the gas. This is basically a solid chamber uh, with seals around it so no, no air can get in. We need a, something to heat up to do the evaporation here. I've shown a tungsten, or a sim symbolically shown a tungsten heater wire and a power supply to generate the, the power to heat it. If I put a metal on that resistance wire and heat it up, the metal will evaporate, goes in all directions. And if I put a substrate there, it will collect on the substrate, just like the water vapor collected on the, the silver spoon that I have here. So the solid the vapor transition happens at the source, the resistance wire. The transport happens between the wire and the substrate, and we have condensation at the substrate. Each one of those steps is important. There are three reasons for vacuum deposition or vacuum evaporation of thin films. We've talked about reducing the boiling point. I also want to talk about reducing scattering as well, and later we'll talk about reducing reactions with air. So at low pressures, if we heat up a container or a vessel of something that can vaporize, we um, convert it to a gas, it gets transported to the substrate, and we're fine, the vapor condenses on the substrate. This cartoon is an exaggeration. We don't have a gas flame inside of our vacuum systems, but I use that to illustrate heating. On the other hand, if we do it at high pressures, what happens is the vapor condenses before reaching the substrate, just like clouds, moisture condensing in clouds. If we want to make a coating on our substrate, we want it to condense on the substrate not in the intervening space, and so we need low pressures to get the transport from the source down here at the bottom to the substrate up at the top. The three states of water, solid, liquid, and vapor, and again, I just want to emphasize that this is not steam. That's water vapor. It's already condensed. If you put your hand up here, it'll be warm, but you won't get instant burn, but if you put your finger right at the spout of the teapot where the steam is not condensed into water vapor, that's where the bad burns occur. Don't do that at home. It's not worthwhile demonstrating. Most materials we're familiar with go through these same uh, solid to liquid to vapor transitions, but some, some materials actually go from solid to vapor with no liquid state in between. Chromium is one of them. We have an example of that as well. And most of you are familiar with dry ice, it's carbon dioxide. It goes from solid to liquid with no li or solid to gas with no liquid transition. It sublimes. So I want to talk about the variation of the mean free path with pressure, talking about it reducing scattering. At 10 to the minus 4, this is just a nomograph. Wherever you put a vertical line, you can read the pressure on the top and the mean free path at the bottom. <clears throat> at 10 to the minus 4 tor, the mean free path is half a meter or 20 inches. I happen to know that because I do this presentation and others often enough, so that's in my head. At 10 to the minus 6 tor, we're down two orders of magnitude, a factor of 100 in pressure. The mean free path increases by a factor of 100. It's now 50 meters or 165 feet. Um, I need to mention the mean free path. What does that mean? That's the distance, mean being the arithmetic average. It's the distance that an atom or molecule can move in at that pressure before it hits another gas molecule on average. So on the average, if we generate a gas molecule at 10 to the minus, oops, 10 to the minus 4 tor, it can go 20 inches before it hits another gas molecule. Okay? And so in our vacuum systems, uh, typically we have spacing like this, maybe like this in a roll coder, which we'll talk about later. We can get transport between our source and our substrate without any collisions, and certainly at 10 to the minus 6 tor, which we have in many of our laboratory vacuum systems, uh, it can go all the way across the chamber without hitting anything. I want to emphasize again that this notion of reducing scattering. Sound is transmitted by scattered 
as a compression wave, the scattering of gas molecules off one another. I have a buzzer here that I'm going to hook up to a, a power supply and makes a lot of noise, so I'm going to disconnect it here for just a minute. And as I remove the gas from the vacuum system, we will see that the sound disappears. And we don't have to get very low before the sound disappears, simply because there's no gas. The mean free path now becomes the size of the chamber. We don't have any way to transport the sound from the source to the walls of the chamber and into the gas that's in our atmosphere here around the room. And here's my plug and the other end of my cord. Here it is. And so I, excuse me, you can probably hear that. If I put that on, put the lid on top, that cuts out some of the sound just because of its physical barrier. But as I remove the gas from the chamber, it'll be more effective when I turn the vacuum pump off and we let the atmosphere back in because the pump is making enough noise to mask what's going on in here. But as the pressure gets lower, the sound is decreasing. And if the pump were, does a perfect job, the sound would completely disappear. I can still hear it, but I suspect that most of you can just barely hear it, or maybe not at all. But if I, I'm going to stand still so that the mic can pick this up as I let the air back in. There's some air. And all we've done is change the mean free path by reducing the pressure removing enough of the gas molecules so that the, the sound can't be transported from the source to the edge of the chamber and into the, the room. And we need to do that in our vacuum systems for vacuum coating so we can transport the material we want to condense on our substrate to the substrate from the source. My dog is too smart to howl at the moon. He says it's pointless because in space no one can hear him bark. A vacuum, no sound. If movies were true to life, space movies would be a lot like silent movies. There would be no air in space, and so sound waves are virtually absent. All those enormous explosions don't make any noise at all. But that's like saying none of our sunsets comes with background music from string ensembles. And we all know that sunsets always come with the string ensemble playing. To give you an idea of the mean free path, I've drawn a sphere big sphere on the slide and two small, smaller spheres. The second one is 10 times smaller than the large one. I'm going to shrink that one again by a factor of 10. There it is. You could maybe not even notice it down there, that little guy down on the right-hand side. That's another factor of 10 smaller. To give you an idea of what the mean free path is, that would be the mean free path at atmospheric pressure if that's the size of our gas molecule. So if a tennis ball is the size of an atmospheric gas molecule, the mean free path is from here, this wall, oop, all the way over to that other wall. I didn't throw it quite far enough. It's 38 feet. We think about, scientists think about gas molecules in the atmosphere bouncing against each other at ferocious rates. And yet, the mean free path is huge at atmospheric pressure. What's going on here? It's because the average gas velocity, the velocity of the gas molecules is 850 miles an hour. So yes, indeed, they are colliding at ferocious rates, but most of the gas around us is empty space because the mean free path, the size of a tennis ball, is almost 40 feet. I hope most of you can appreciate that that looks like a candle. We're going to do another demonstration here. Some, what happens if I put a candle inside my vacuum system? 
It'll go out. Actually, that's not the interesting part. Yes, it will go out because we remove the oxygen. There's nothing there to support the flame, which is a combustion process. It needs oxygen. Let me put this in here and see if we can get this set up so it'll be seen on the slide. Because what's going to happen first is we'll reduce the pressure enough so that the mean free path gets large enough and we'll eliminate convection, which is air currents moving around. But even before that, if I do this well, leave this cover on, get rid of the drafts, I'm going to let combustion go for a little bit. The first thing you, you may be able to see in the room and maybe on the video is we'll get a cloud forming and it'll all disappear instantly or not so instantly. That's the water vapor, which is the product of combustion condensing as we reduce the pressure. Oops, it went too far. I'll have to do it again. So the cloud is just the water vapor condensing as we reduce the pressure. As we reduce the pressure, the gas expands. As gas expands, they cool. We'll see that more in a, in a minute. Now I don't need to wait so long. And I'll quit talking and pay attention. That's not smoke, that's water vapor. Almost caught it. It gets spherical just before it goes out. That's because there's no, there's no longer enough gas inside the chamber to support convection. The shape of the candle flame is because the hot air is rising. If you remove enough air so there's no convection, hot air no longer is rising because that's what convection is, and the flame becomes spherical. That's the normal shape of a flame in the absence of convection. That was actually an experiment on the space shuttle. Not in a vacuum, but in zero gravity. There's no convection either. So that's what the candle looks like. That is an image from NASA to give you a better view of what you might have been able to see here. Except that one cost $5 million. Because the last thing you want on the shuttle is a fire. Because there's no place to run. <laughs> so, um, and that is an image from NASA. So we talked about temperature versus alta. We talked about the fact that as we reduce the pressure, the temperature goes down. Uh, you can see that this is a standard atmospheric plot. Temperature on the left-hand side, Celsius on the right. This is Fahrenheit on the left. As you go up in altitude in space, uh, we start out at something like 60 degrees Fahrenheit on a particular day. And as you get up to the edge of the atmosphere, it's down to almost minus 70. That's simply because you're reducing the pressure and gases cool as they expand. So here is an image across the street from my home, my corporate headquarters, some nice clouds. As warm air rises, it expands and cools. The water vapor condenses into water droplets, eventually to ice crystals. Gravity causes these droplets and crystals to fall, causing rain and snow. When we pump down our vacuum systems, the gas expands and cools. I ask the question, does it rain inside your vacuum system? And my answer is, if you don't do something special to avoid it, every time it rains inside your vacuum system. It might be only momentarily like it did here, uh, but it's something in semiconductor technology, they do quite elaborate stuff to keep that from happening. Talk to me later if you need uh, more information. When we return, we'll talk about making uh, vacuum thin films, reducing the reactions with air. We've talked about reducing the boiling point and transporting the, uh, re increasing the mean free path so we can transport things. We'll talk about measuring vacuum levels, producing vacuum, and some examples of vacuum thin films and the equipment to make it. In case you're interested in who I am and where I come from, there's something we don't need to read it, but it's there. And three reasons for vacuum evaporation of thin films. We've talked about reducing the boiling point. We've talked a little bit about reducing scattering, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, and we'll talk about reducing the reactions with air in just a moment. So what I'm going to do now is demonstrate how a neon 
tube works and if we get the lights down a little bit, what we have here is simply a, a clear a plastic tube, if I can get untangled here, connected to my vacuum system. And I've got what's called a Tesla coil, which generates high voltage, high frequency. It's high voltage, but not dangerous to me because it's very high frequency. And Nikolai Tesla developed that many years ago. And what I want to do for, before I got my vacuum system in, before I open it, I'm going to turn on the Tesla coil, and it's going to get, give us noise in this mic system, so I'll try to be gentle, and I can see that it's probably sparking here, and as I reduce the pressure, could we have the lights down a little bit? Thank you. You may be able to see a few sparks here. Let's see if we can get this to work. See more sparks or a glow right here at the tip, but as we reduce the pressure, the mean free path increases. So the ionization that's generated at the tip can travel the length of the tube and light up the entire tube. And that's simply changing the mean free path. As I let air back into the system, it extinguishes the glow. It's still high voltage right here. We're still, I can see the little sparks at the tip. But as I reduce the pressure again, the glow extends and eventually travels the length of the path. That's exactly how neon lights work in your in signing. They have a glass envelope, which is reduced pressure, and they have a high voltage uh, source at one end, and it's grounded at the other end through the vacuum pump. I'll turn this off so I don't get a shock. And we have neon lights. These are the characteristic colors of the five rare earth gases. And you get mixtures of colors by mixing those together and adding other things. And you can get almost any color in the rainbow that you would like to have out of neon lights operating basically the same way. And you have to have the mean free path long enough so that that discharge can go the length of the tube and light up the entire tube. So we've talked about making vacuums in film. We've talked about methods of converting solids to gases for evaporations. We need to, or we need to talk about methods to do that. Basically, how do you boil things? It's not much different than in the kitchen, just a little difference. We talk about resistance heating and electron beam evaporation. I guess we don't have electron beam in the kitchen, and we're not going to talk about these others because they're rather more uh, narrow use. But for a resistance evaporation, just think of a kitchen toaster. On the left, it's in the off configuration. On the right, it's in use. It's hot. It's basically a resistance wire. You put current through it. It heats up and cooks everything in the environment. And we do the same thing for resistance evaporation in a vacuum. Here are some images from R.D. Mathis Company. They're courtesy of them. Those are tungsten wires, almost every one of them, in various shapes and geometries. Scale at the bottom gives you an idea of what size they are. Here is a tungsten wire basket that's been used to coat gold. There's gold remaining on it. Please don't take it. Gold's worth a lot, but not that much. This is aluminum, has been used for aluminum. This one has been used for silver. And basically all we do is we take these wires, put an electrical connection at each end, just like your toaster, put current through it, heat it up. We can get it as hot as we need to evaporate any of the materials that we want to evaporate, just like we saw on the chart to give us an idea of what those might be like. We talked about chrome as a material that sublimes. This is a wire, tungsten wire with chrome electrodeposited on it, and it basically heat this up. It doesn't melt. It just simply goes from solid to liquid. When we're using one of these or something like this, it's a tungsten wire. When we just put some chips or hairpins of silver or aluminum or gold in it, it wets the tungsten wire. It doesn't drip down like water would when it forms a liquid. Uh, it just wets the wire and then evaporates off the wire from a liquid state. Our wire heaters are no different than what's in a, a light bulb, tungsten material. You can see that it's a little thicker than a light bulb. And we use more current because, number one, we want higher temperatures and we need it to be ro more robust. A light bulb, half an amp, typical resistance evaporator, 500 amps, so a 1,000 times more current uh, as we may need. It might be less than that. 
I've shown you some sources. Uh, and I also explained the fact that we typically put on just a little hairpin, let's say aluminum. The aluminum melts, sticks to the tungsten wire, and then evaporates from there. We'll show you a system uh, using that technology uh, later in the course or in the pr presentation. We can also do what's called, use what's called foil heaters. It's just typically molybdenum or tantalum foil. Um, you put a little drop of material or solid chunk of material in the little divot that's the, in there. Again, clamp it on either end, put high current through it. Uh, it gets it hot enough in the center to evaporate the material. Nothing evaporates in that direction because it's, it's all going to go up, but it coats everything you put up here. And just like if you put your substrate up here, you'll coat that as well. Some of you may have crock pots at home or slow cookers. We have one. This is ours. It's the brand name's rival. It's called a crock pot. Maybe other people call it slow cookers, but oops. Basically, we have a heating element on the right-hand side and a container on the left-hand side for the food. You can take the container out to wash it without uh, getting the heating element in the water. We do the same thing in vacuum evaporation. We have, call them crucibles and heaters, and we have some crucibles and heaters here. Uh, this is a, one of the heating elements. Again, tungsten wire. Grab it on each end with electrical contacts. Put a lot of current through it. With a crucible inside, it's a ceramic crucible. This happens to be aluminum, I think, or tin. Maybe it's tin. It's tin. I just looked at it. Uh, and it's, this is what looks like after it's been used. Some of the tin is evaporated, and some of it's condensed on the edges of the crucible as well. This one might look like gold. But it's not. It's silver. Uh, it's just that silver oxidizes to a gold color uh, in, this, in this configuration. So it's basically a crucible and a heater, just like the crock pot liner and heater itself. We showed you the sources. Another kind of source that we use, especially for aluminum, is a ceramic bar. Again, you just clamp onto each end, put a ferocious amount of current through the ceramic bar. It's an electrically conductive ceramic electrically resistive ceramics, or as you put current through it, it heats up, and aluminum is placed into the little trough on the surface. And in fact, the way it's done is a continuous wire is fed into the system as it's being evaporated. This is what's used for making potato chip bags, the aluminum coating in potato chips bags, and other things as well. Here it is in operation. It looks almost, it's yellow heat. We can get a guesstimate of what the temperature is if the color for the image uh, were accurate, and I'm not sure that it is or not. And you can see the aluminum wire feed coming in down, or excuse me, from the right-hand side of the image, feeding down onto the surface, and it basically, uh, the aluminum is leaving just as fast as the wire is being fed in, and that's how the rate is controlled. Also, electron beam heating is used uh, quite a bit in the laboratory as well as in production for the, the lenses that I have on. It's almost certainly done by electron beam evaporation. This is a simple cartoon of a way that doesn't work, but it's a way that was first demonstrated for electron beam heating. We have a tungsten filament in the upper left-hand corner with an AC source uh, supplied to it, something like 6 volts, 100 amps, gives you a, a nice white-hot filament. What you may not know is not only does heat come off the filament, light come off the filament, but electrons boil off the filaments as well. We don't use the electrons that are boiling off the filament and the light bulb, but they are there. But we do use it when we do electron beam evaporation. And the way we do it, electrons are negatively charged. They're attracted to a positive source. So we'll put a metal plug in there and bias the system to 10,000 volts, say. It's easy to get an amp of current from a tungsten filament. And if we accelerate to 10,000 volts, a volts times an amp is a watt, that's 10 kilowatts of power that we can focus onto the surface of that metal plug. Enormous amount of power concentrated in a very small area. We can evaporate anything, even refractory metals, refractory ceramics. We can evaporate anything. The problem is the metal atoms coat everything, including our tungsten filament. And filament, tungsten gives off lots of electrons, but if we're coating copper, for example, if you coat the filament with copper, no electrons come off. So we, the process stops. So some 30 years ago, an invention, you put the filament down below the source, and what I've drawn is a sort of a, a, a trapezoid with a, it's a, basically a copper body with a crucible in the center with a little dish 
shaped a charge that's the evaporant material. If you put the tungsten filament below the source, electrons are charged. We can use magnetic fields to bend them. They're very light. It's easy to do. And so we bend them through 270 degrees as it happens. It works out very nicely. That's the, the number of degrees in that arc between the source at the bottom and the, and the material we want to evaporate at the top. And now we can evaporate metal atoms. But what may not be obvious is we can also evaporate metal oxide, insulating materials, just as well as metals. It works swimmingly. And that's what's used in production. Here's what a system might look like. Again, we need a vacuum chamber and a vacuum pump. Here's our electron beam source. This time we've shown it with an electron beam gun separate from the source. The electrons are bent with a magnetic field, heats up what's ever here. We can put many kilowatts of power into a small spot. We have a, used to have a system within 3M that had a 90 kilowatt uh, system, easily done. The material evaporates, covers everything above it, and if we put a substrate up here, we'll get a coating on it. And we have, now we have high voltage power supplies instead of low voltage as we did with the resistance evaporation system. Here's a photo of a system built by Denton. Uh, we have an electron beam source right here, and another one that's on the right-hand side in the front, and another one towards the back that's hidden by some of the other pieces that are there. The yellow or brass-colored on the right front is a resistance evaporator with two posts sticking up for current and the evaporation system between the two posts. And over each of the sources, or four in the system, two electron beam sources and two resistance sources, there are shutters that you can basically move out of the way or in the flux of the evaporant. So you get the process started, open the shutter, coat your substrate to the point at which you, or the coating is just what you want, and close the shutter to immediately stop the evaporation process. Lots of details. We could talk about this for a long time. Not appropriate for this presentation today. So we've talked about the three reasons for vacuum evaporation, but not yet talked about reducing the reactions with air. We want to talk about that now. Think about a light bulb filament. It burns brightly in a good vacuum, but it burns literally in a poor vacuum, and we want to demonstrate that right now. What I'm going to do is take a flashlight bulb that I prepared at home by breaking off the glass envelope. It's a standard flashlight bulb, and put it inside its holder, and we'll put it inside the vacuum system and see how, it, how well it performs. It may have gotten damaged in transport here this morning. If we do, we have a spare to try out as well. Just going to connect the two leads so I can put some power through it, just like our evaporation systems would want to have. Arrange it so you can see it and the camera as well. I'm going to want to pump down the system first. So we're at vacuum. We have a tungsten filament inside the chamber uh, with no glass envelope around it anymore. And if I get the connection right, it lights up just like you expect it to. But now if I put atmosphere back in there, as soon as I heat up the tungsten filament, instead of lighting up, it will light up only momentarily, and it burns up. The smoke that you saw is tungsten oxide, which is a white powder. And that's what would happen on our light bulbs, to your light bulbs whenever the glass envelope breaks as well. We need vacuum if we want to coat aluminum and transport it from our source to our substrate. And we don't want aluminum oxide. We want aluminum. We need to remove enough of the oxygen so the probability that it will react with air, oxygen in the air, is reduced so we can get a metal coating on our substrate, just like uh, this demonstrates. You've actually seen this, or you may have seen it. It's demonstrated in these uh, decorative lamps more often than with a standard light bulb because the filament is a long way away from the glass envelope in one of these, but it's quite close to uh, in one of these decorative bulbs. And the black on the outside of the envelope is just when the tungsten filament fails and evaporates 
by getting a hot spot and evaporates onto the surface of the glass envelope. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. We also use that in vacuum deposition. And as we add energy to a system, we go from a solid to a liquid to a gas to a plasma. Here's an image from the web of a plasma. And I've got one of these plasma balls myself here. You can get them so they work off of a UHB uh, off your computer. If we could have a light, I guess you can see that just as well. This is a demonstration you can come up with and play with later. And the charges that are formed are attracted to your, your surface of your, anything you touch here. And we can play with that later after the presentation as well. And if you want to look at that on the web, there it is with a reference at the bottom as well. We use plasmas for a process called sputtering. Sputtering has been likened to billiard balls with atoms. We basically take ions and smash them into a solid surface. It's like atomic sandblasting. It turns out that the physics is not like that. But if it makes it easier for you to understand to think about it that way, that's fine. Sputtering is used for etching. You can remove the surface material. We use it for cleaning. We use it in analytical chemistry. But it also can be used as for a deposition process as an alternate method for producing a vapor, an alternate to evaporation. Sputtering is very easy to understand. If I take a metal plate, put it inside of a vacuum system, put an electric field on it, take copper as an example so that the copper plate is negative, put it inside of a vacuum system at the right pressure, will generate a glow, a plasma, will generate argon ions if we put argon into the system. Uh, the argon atoms are positive. They'll be attracted to the negative potential on the metal plate. They'll come in and smash at high energy, a few hundred volts. That's enough energy to kick off uh, atoms from the metal plate, the copper in this example, and it also kicks out electrons, and those are needed to sustain the plasma. If we put a substrate anywhere above that metal plate, it will get coated with copper. That's all there is to sputtering, except no one does it that way. We always use magnetically enhanced sputtering. Most of you know what a horseshoe magnet is. I've sort of drawn one with a cartoon of the magnetic fields around it. And so we put basically a magnet behind that copper plate to concentrate the plasma. It just makes life a lot easier for those of us doing the work. You can make them round, as, as we see on the right-hand side. We can make them rectangular, so that, and this is typically used in larger coders, and we have a lot of those around. And basically, the magnetic field concentrates the plasma, the blue glow around the, basically what looks like a racetrack there. And all the material removal happens right underneath that area where the plasma is concentrated. Here's an image of what one might look like. In operation, again, you can see the intense glow just where the magnetic field concentrates it. I have a demonstration for you. It's a very simple magnetron demonstration. It's a, right here. It's a cylindrical stainless steel body on the outside with magnetic poles on the inside. We'll put this inside of our vacuum system and connect it to a high-voltage power supply, and we'll see that the, we'll get a glow that's concentrated exactly where the... Uh, edges of the magnetic field are uh, where that, well, we'll put about 500 volts on it, and where the plasma is illustrated in the cartoon or the slide, uh, that's where we should see the glow. We need to get a pretty good pressure before we get to uh, a spot where this will operate, so this will take a, a, a minute or two. What you're seeing there is a little bit of a glow, uh, not very focused. It's, that would, what would be comparable to St. Elmo's fire. You may have heard of that, the glow around uh, lightning rods or especially airplanes uh, at low pressure. We've got to get lower pressure yet to make the sputtering system work and have that concentration of the, the glow where we want it to be. A little lower pressure, I think, yet. And there it is. We're putting 500 volts. It turns out AC on here, but it doesn't make any difference. The plasma is going off on and off faster than you can see. And the plasma is glowing with high concentration right around where the magnetic field focuses it. But there's also a minor glow around the rest of the system. If we were at still lower pressures, the kinds of pressures we would use normally during sputtering, the glow around the edges uh, would be much reduced compared to the glow where the magnetic field is.
And of course, letting gas back into the system quenches the plasma immediately because the main free paths are too small to support the discharge. Some of you say, may say you've never seen sputtering. I would like to challenge that. This is a fluorescent lamp, and we have an electrode at one end. It's just a tungsten filament. It generates electrons, generates a plasma in a, there's a small puddle of mercury in every fluorescent tube. It generates a plasma in a mercury. That mercury plasma generates ultraviolet light. There's a phosphor on the edge of the surface of the tube that converts the ultraviolet light to visible light. The different colors of fluorescent lamps are just different phosphors. The plasma stays the same. But what's happening, if you could now look at the uh, process, we've got a tungsten filament at high voltage. Same kind of sputtering process occurs, not, not magnetically accentuated, but the sputtering of the tungsten filament eventually leads to failure of the fluorescent tube. If you look at a germicidal lamp, it's a quartz envelope rather than glass, and there's no phosphor because a germicidal lamp wants the ultraviolet light from the plasma directly. And in a germicidal lamp in operation, you see not only the glow along the length of the tube, but also an intense glow on the tungsten filament because it's being bombarded by the plasma at every cycle as well. And so eventually what happens is tungsten gets sputtered onto the glass envelope and colors the end of your fluorescent tube, and that's what a fluorescent tube light looks like often at the end of life. I call this a green fluorescent lamp. It, that's not your eyes making uh, bad measurements. That's a red fluorescent lamp, and you'll see many more of these in the future because environmentally green fluorescent lamps have reduced mercury in them in order to have less mercury contamination at the end of life. But mercury is consumed in a fluorescent lamp because it gets embedded into the glass and doesn't always come off. So at the end of life, you may get to the end of life of the mercury before the plasma extinguishes. That's the color of the plasma without any mercury left in the lamp. This was actually taken in a nearby building, the one that I worked in. We've talked about vacuum levels, atmospheric pressure down to very, very low pressures. We've seen this plot before. We've talked about the enormous changes in mean free paths, the enormous changes in gas density. We'll talk about the ways to generate these and the ways to measure these pressure levels at, at the various ways as well. Think about first measurement of the vacuum, thinking about the idea of a Bourdon gauge. This is a party favor. That's exactly how a Bourdon gauge works. By changing the pressure inside of a tube, I can make the tube expand. And I think I have an image of a Bourdon gauge here. Make the, by changing the pressure inside the tube, it's this semicircular tube on the right-hand side of the left image. It's actually, a, it's not a solid piece. It's a tube that's connected to the pressure connection at the bottom and to a, a, me, a gear mechanism at the upper left. And by changing the pressure inside the tube, that semicircular device opens and closes the gear mechanism causes the dial to move. And that's actually an image of this gauge right here. You can come up and look at it after the presentation if you're interested. And just the slight movement of the, the uh, tube here gives you quite a dramatic movement through the mechanical connection to the needle. The Bourdon gauge was invented in France, 1849. John Ashcroft, no relation to the John Ashcroft we know today, in 19, 1852 went to France and got the license for the Western Hemisphere. Very important development. Can you imagine why people were interested in measuring pressures in the mid-1800s? What was the normal use of power? Steam was where power came from in the 1800s. The most dangerous job in a steam plant is the guy who had to tend the boiler because before 1850, there were no gauges on the boilers. He had to maintain the pressure by eye, if you will. This made it much safer and really allowed the expansion of steam power to become as ubiquitous, ubiquitous as it did by the end of the century. So Ashcroft had the license. In fact, this gauge is still made by the Ashcroft company. There it is on the 
legend as well. If you go to France, they're Bourdon gauges, or Europe, but here they're Ashcroft. Played an important role in the widespread use of the steam power. We can also think of a capsule gauge. Um, if I take a, by now you should know, if I take this balloon and put it inside my vacuum system, the balloon is tied off at the end. Let me get rid of this guy. What's going to happen to it? As I pump down the chamber, there's gas inside the balloon. As I pump down the chamber, as the pressure goes down, the size of the balloon increases. Shouldn't be a surprise. That's basically how a capsule gauge works, except we don't use rubber balloons because they're not uh, very durable. And as I you see it more dramatically, as, as I but basically use the fact that a, a small chamber with gas inside of it will change its volume as the pressure changes. And what a capsule gauge looks like is something like this in a cartoon. We have a flexible metal um, container. Uh, at higher pressure, uh, it expands. At a lower pressure, it contracts. And we have one of them right here you can take a look at. This one's actually gotten kind of beat up, but it's basically a brass uh, dish, a uh, quarter inch, eighth of an inch apart, sealed together, connected to a gas feed at this end, and by the expansion, you can see there's a little needle in here that's connected uh, to a mechanism that drives the, the gauge itself. No more complicated than a balloon inside of a vacuum system, but more reproducible. Aneroid barometers are simply the same thing, except there's a stack of about seven or eight of these uh, cylinders or capsules inside the aneroid barometer to give enough movement to uh, get a readout on the rotating cylinder device. Think about a thermos model. We use that as an introduction to thermocouple gauges. How does a thermos model work? Well, I won't make you answer that. I'll tell you. It's a vacuum flask, vacuum. Double insulate, double walled glass container with vacuum in between and silvered surfaces uh, between the walls. The vacuum is to reduce conduction and convection, and the silver surface uh, reflects radiant heat. What happens if you have a crack in your thermos bottle? If you lose the vacuum, it's no longer a thermos bottle. It's just an ordinary container. It no longer retains the heat because it doesn't, you now have convection and conduction through that uh, gas layer that's there. And basically, it's the same principle when we have a thermocouple gauge. It's simply a wire inside of our vacuum system. Uh, we heat up the wire and measure the temperature of the wire with a thermocouple connected to an external meter. We put constant current through the wire. Uh, as the pressure goes up, there's more gas molecules bouncing against it to take the heat away. The wire gets hotter. We just develop a calibration curve between the temperature of the wire and the pressure that we want to measure. It's a rough approximation, but it can do very well uh, for intermediate pressures, as we'll see. And it turns out that um, thermocouple gauges are pretty uninteresting. If you open one up, and I have, all there are are two very tiny wires inside, smaller than a human hair. So if you look at it, there's really nothing to see. It's just basically a wire connected in four different places, as it shows there, plus and minus, and the two meter connections. So I don't have one opened up because there's not much to see. But when we think about gas phase heat transfer, it's important to realize that different mechanisms occur at different pressures. We've got pressure plotted along the x-axis here. And at all pressures, we have radiation. If something gets hot enough to radiate infrared or visible light, Heat can be taken away that way. We have conduction, that's gas molecules bumping against each other uh, in the intermediate pressure range and higher. But at something like 10 to the minus 3 torr, conduction ceases because there's not enough gas molecules around. And at much higher pressures, uh, say above 1 torr, maybe 5 torr, we have also convection, which is actually the mass movement of air. And so that's a, a different mechanism as well, flow of current of hot air to areas of cold air. So thermocouple gauges really work in this intermediate range. They don't work at high pressure, and they don't work at very low pressures. And those of you who are in the, in the field know that that's 
to be true. There's also 30 or 40 years ago, people had developed convection gauges, which work over the whole range from 10 to the minus 3 up to an atmosphere. And one of the, I just put this as an aside, one of the fourth reasons for vacuum evaporation is we can get things very hot inside of our vacuum chamber, but we don't have any conduction or convection, so our chamber walls don't get enormously hot as well. It's just a benefit. Just to think about this again, at high pressures, if we have a hot uh, body at the left-hand side illustrated in red, we can think about heat transfer occurring through molecular collisions by one molecule picking up heat as it collides with that hot surface and, and transferring heat to another molecule so that we can think about that as working. But at very low pressures, heat transfer becomes very inefficient because there are no molecules around to carry the heat away. And that's why thermocouple gauges basically quit working at lower pressures. It basically doesn't work any longer. A Pirani gauge is much like a thermocouple gauge, except there are two filaments. One is at a vacuum reference level. It just is a better way electrically or gauging-wise to measure it. It can go to slightly hot lower pressures than a thermocouple gauge, and you can look that up for more information if you're interested. Uh, capacitance manometers are also used, and basically the capacitance of two metal plates adjacent to one another changes as the distance between them changes. As you get closer, the capacitance goes up. If, now if you take a metal diaphragm and make one rigid and one flexible, I flex it, it gets closer. By putting high pressure on the process pressure side on the right, we push that membrane, flexible membrane, closer to the rigid one, we can measure that as a change in capacitance. And you can make that very accurately uh, measured as well. What I have on this system is so-called dual sensor gauge. It's a tiny little uh, instrument right here, read out here with the electronics here. It's actually made using semiconductor miniaturization techniques. It has two different detectors in it. One is a piezo-resistive sensor. It's on a membrane uh, illustrated in the upper left. And as the membrane flexes, the, the material on top of it, these, these so-called bridge resistors, um, as they flex, they're piezo-resistive. The resistance changes just with the flexion that they sense. And we can read that out. And we have basically a Pirani sensor on the right. And the advantage here, because it's miniaturized, it gives us to, can go to much lower pressure simply because it's only got a 5 micron gap between the sensor and the uh, heat sink that's around it. Uh, there's lots of details about that we could explain, but don't need to here. And basically, it can read from 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to atmospheric pressure. Uh, there's an overlap region where the, you get readout from both, gate, from both sensors, and there's a computer, basically a computer chip that does the calibration. It's very accurate, very compact, a sweet little device. An ionization gauge is used for still lower pressures. Now, as we get to lower pressures, remember there's much less gas atoms and molecules there. And so what we do is actually use a tungsten filament, this white hairpin on the right-hand side, heat that up, gives off electrons just like in our light bulb uh, and in our fluorescent lights. Uh, we have a, a helical grid, which is biased to attract the electrons. Generates, it draws the electrons into the center of that helical grid. And any ions that are formed are collected on the ion collector, which has got a negative voltage on it to collect any positive ions. And you say to yourself, if you've got so few atoms and molecules there, how can this possibly work? Can't generate many ions if there aren't many atoms there to begin with. But we use typically 10 milliamps of electron current coming off of that filament. That's 6 times 10 to the 16th electrons every second. To give you a sense of that, that's the number of seconds in 2 billion years. So we just have enough electrons. 10 milliamps isn't very much current, but we have so many electrons we can measure pressures down to 10 to the minus 11 torr uh, with a gauge like this. And there's an image of one without a mounted directly inside the system. Here's a one on the right that's mounted outside the system in a glass envelope connected through a port. Um, here's two ion gauges, actually one ion gauge, two images of it, one with the filament off, it's not operating, one with the filament on in operation. And then I have an ion gauge here that's mounted inside of a plastic cage or a plastic bottle that you can come up and take a look at if you'd like to see that in more detail after the presentation. Ion gauges aren't much different than a fluorescent lamp. 
We just have an electrode, tungsten filament on the left, boiling off electrons, generating the plasma. It turns out for the lamp, we generate the plasma to get the, the glow from an ion gauge. We generate electrons to measure the current. So that we've talked about measuring vacuum. We want to talk now about making vacuum. There are many ways to make vacuum. There are many kinds of pumps. We'll talk about three different classes of pumps. They're categorized as compression pumps, uh, or compressor pumps, momentum transfer pumps, and capture pumps. Uh, there are various kinds of compressor pumps, some of which are very unfamiliar, but some of them are very familiar. This is a fan from an electronic uh, device, probably a, a PC in the old days. The fan on the right-hand side is out of my vacuum cleaner. That's a replacement fan out of the vacuum cleaner. Just spin them around, and it pushes the air molecules out. They're used in superchargers and turbochargers in cars as well, same sorts of things. Uh, this is an image from the web of a vacuum cleaner, just to remind you that nothing really sucks. A vacuum cleaner does not work by drawing things into a vacuum, or not sucking things into the vacuum. Basically, the fan in the vacuum lowers the pressure inside so that the higher pressure of the air outside is drawn into that lower pressure area, and that higher pressure air picks up the dust and dirt and transfers it into where the vacuum or the lower pressure is area. So it's the higher pressure that's doing the, the cleaning. It's not the vacuum that's the clean. The vacuum has to be there to work, but it's the, the higher pressure outside that's doing it, just like the soda straw here as well. Nothing really sucks. Same thing happens when drinking through a straw. Higher pressure outside pushes the soda up the straw when you lower the pressure in your mouth. So a diff Diaphragm pump is just a flexible membrane at the bottom connected to a, a, a movement that goes up and down, and it's basically doing the same thing as the vacuum cleaner does. It reduces the pressure when the membrane goes down. The, the air coming in in yellow gets drawn into the system. When the membrane goes up, the valve in the yellow closes, and it, the pressure goes up and exhaust through the uh, valve that goes out to the red and these work for intermediate pressures and atmospheric pressure. A roots blower is very familiar for people doing high volume uh, production work. Uh, they're basically counter rotating lobes that, that draw the air in at the top and in the yellow and push it out into the bottom. Uh, they can move an enormous amount of air, but they can't generate uh, very high pressure differentials because there's nothing, there's no seals inside the system. It's just close tolerance machining. Here's some scroll pump technology. That's what I have here, courtesy of Variant people. They gave this to me to use this for a demonstration. It basically has two scrolls that look virtually identical. The one on the right in the housing that you can't see is stationary. The one on the left basically just rotates around like this. And it, it, what happens is that air enters at the outside. As the scroll moves around, it pushes the air through the path and down into the center of the pump where it's exhausted. It's a little bit tricky to imagine how that works, but if you stare at it long enough, uh, you can get it. The advantage here is there's no oil contamination. You can get something like four times lower pressures than with a diaphragm pump, but they are more expensive than, say, an oil-sealed rotary vane pump, which we'll talk about now. This is the ubiquitous pump in vacuum technology, the so-called mechanical pump. Technically, it's an oil-sealed rotary vane pump. And what we have is a cylindrical body, took a look at image number one, a cylindrical body with its a rotating cylinder offset inside of it. In that rotating cylinder are two veins, one of them I colored red, just so you can follow it around as we move through the positions here. So if you go from one to two, it's moved a quarter of a turn, and it's captured a big gulp of air coming in from the tube above it. And as it moves to position three, it's compressing the air, and position four, it's basically compress the air so there's no volume left. As that movable vein, the, right, the red vein, uh, pushes past that exhaust port. There's oil inside the pump, which is the yellow stuff at the top. That air is bubbling through. And that coats the veins so that you have an oil seal between the veins as they rotate and the body of the pump. So you can get very low pressures and good uh, work, uh, work out of the pump. It works from atmospheric pressure down to something like 10 to the minus 2 torr. They're everywhere. 
I'm going to talk about how, not only how they work, but how well they work. The base pressure is limited by the vapor pressure of the oil and the compression of the pump. We won't talk about that. The time to reach any particular pressure, any particular base pressure low enough to do a coating, obviously depends on the size of the pump. Also depends on the volume of the chamber, how big the pipe is, the length of the pipe, and the cleanliness of everything. If you put a dirty, something dirty in your system or lots of water, it'll take you a lot longer to pump down. To, to give you an example, the time to pump a 100 liter chamber from 760 torr atmospheric pressure to a tenth of a torr, 100 liter chamber is a 20 by 20 by 20, for example. It's 18 minutes with a 5 CFM pump. You can get a 5 CFM pump cubic feet per minute for about $1,500. If you want to spend more money, you can reduce that by more than a factor of 10, just because you have a larger pump pumped down the same chamber. My pump is about a 2.1 CFM pump, and because it's scroll technology, costs more than the much larger uh, um, oil-sealed pump, uh, but it has the advantage of no oil, as I said. Pumping speed versus uh, pressure. This is what a, a pump, this is a pumping speed on the left and the pressure on the x-axis. And as a single stage pump, it just basically poops out at about 10 to the minus 2 torr. It's not enough. It, it can't seal against a factor of basically 10,000 between 10 to the minus 2 and 760 torr. So what we do is we put two pumps in series with one another, often in the same mechanical setup so that the second stage pump exhausts into the first stage and we get down another factor of two lower in pressure. Very common two-stage pumping, it's called. A rotary piston pump is familiar to people in production because it operates at low RPM and they're huge. They're size of, up to the size of a small uh, automobile sometimes. They're very robust, they last a long time and are useful for moving large quantities of air. We're going to move now from compression pumps, compressor pumps, to momentum transfer pumps. Here are the two examples that we're going to talk about. And what do we mean by momentum transfer? It's easy to think about compression in a high-density gas. If I push this piston, the blue piston on the left, into this gas, we can, think of, we can imagine what compression is. Each of these gas molecules are bouncing against, each one, against one another. Uh, compression we understand here. But as you go to lower pressure, where the mean free path becomes the same size as the chamber, compression doesn't really mean much anymore. So compression, compressor pumps don't work. What does compression mean when the mean free path is greater than the size of the vessel? Again, at 10 to the minus 4 torr, the mean free path is 20 inches. So it would take an enormous piston to compress gas at 10 to the minus 4 torr. So we use momentum transfer pumps. The most ubiquitous is a diffusion pump, and it's basically all it is is a heater with oil in it at the bottom. Uh, we've got boiling oil illustrated at the bottom with a heater. It goes up through a series of chimneys. It's directed down through jets. Literally, they are jets, very tiny holes, to increase the speed. So we get these oil vapor jets directed down. It's cool. The oil condenses. The boiling oil condenses, uh, doing use by virtue of the cooling water surrounding the jacket of the system. Um, basically, large and heavy oil molecules are accelerated to something like 750 miles per hour. When they hit a lighter gas, they're massive. They push that lighter gas down towards the exhaust, and they're removed from the chamber by a rotary vein pump. Here's a cart an illustration or a photo of a cutaway, and they're basically either aluminum or stainless steel inside, nothing more than a heater and a good design of the rest of the system. Very robust, uh, works very, very well. The other kind of compressor pump is a turbomolecular pump. It looks like a jet engine without any fuel, basically fan or turboprop energy engine, basically blades that rotate very, very fast. There's rotating blades and some stationary blades. I'll show you a photograph momentarily, and a motor at the bottom to drive it. It's, Blades move very fast, so for example, at 60,000 RPM, which is not untypical with a 5-inch diameter blade, the tips are moving at over 900 miles an hour. That's faster than the gas molecules are moving. So if the blade comes in at an angle, a gas molecule gets trapped here, it gets bounced down. The pressure increases as we go down the, the, into the depth of the turbo pump, and the, the blade angle changes because the pressure increases Otherwise, we would have a lot of drag on the pumping system. 
and there's a here's a cutaway view. The first stage, the first blade up there is a rotating blade, rotating in the counterclockwise direction. The next set of veins there is actually stationary, so that it traps gas from moving back up the system. They also are very efficient, but more expensive than diffusion pumps typically. When we get to still lower pressures, we go to something called capture pumps. Uh, they're, they're basically the garbage cans of vacuum pumping. You put something in and it stays there. Instead of pushing it out for another pump to remove, it stays there until you regenerate the pump. Uh, before we do that, we need to talk about extremes in temperature as we get cold. We already know that water boils at 212 Fahrenheit or 100 degrees C. In Kelvin units at 373 degrees Kelvin, we're going to use Kelvin units for the rest of this uh, section right here. Ammonia gas liquefies at 241 Kelvin, which is minus, 30, minus 32C or 27F. It's very similar to Freon R12, which is used in air conditioning systems. We'll talk about I have the chart for ammonia, but it looks just like free NR12. Liquid nitrogen uh, boils at uh, 77 degrees Kelvin, much, much colder. Uh, liquid helium, 4 degrees Kelvin, and absolute zero is zero degrees Kelvin, or minus 273C, or 459, 460F. Those numbers, why they're important, are, will be evident in just a moment. But first, I want to take an excursion and talk about a double boiler. My wife makes rice pudding every Christmas. You put rice and milk in the top of the double boiler. You boil water in the bottom. No matter how much uh, heat you put into the system, as long as there's water boiling at the bottom, the top never gets above 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And the rice and the milk don't burn. It's really tricky to do it takes a couple hours to make rice pudding. It's really tricky if you didn't use a double boiler because you'd very often burn the milk or burn the rice. It's basically water heated to the boil. The ingredients are always at 212 degrees because we're just boiling water. It's condensing, transferring all of its heat, and it's not above 212 degrees because that's the boiling point of water. So here's the vapor pressure of common gases versus temperature. Same kinds of curves as we saw before for the elements, except now here's water circled on the, the rightmost circle. As you go up in temperature, excuse me, here's the, the temperature along the x-axis and the pressure along the right axis. It's almost hard to read, but here on the left-hand side, it's the vapor pressure in millimeters or torr, and there's a dotted line at atmospheric pressure labeled the boiling point. So water boils, not surprisingly, at 100 degrees C, or 270 degrees, 3 degrees Kelvin. What I like it, and so that's basically controls the temperature that the double boiler operates at, 100 degrees C. If we boil ammonia or freon, it's going to boil right there at something like minus 37. I can't remember what the number was. So if we have a container of freon or ammonia that's boiling, it's going to be minus 37 degrees, no matter how much heat we put into it, as long as there's some liquid there. We use that for refrigeration. That's how dehumidifiers work, air conditioners work. We don't use it very much in vacuum technology, although there's a few who still hold out to use some of those. We'll talk, talk about that offline if you're interested. More importantly, here's the curve for nitrogen, argon, and oxygen right next to each other. Nitrogen boils at minus, or plus 77 minus, I think I have it there, minus 196 uh, Celsius. That's an important feature because if we have a container in, inside of our vacuum system that has liquid nitrogen in it that we allow to boil, that container is going to stay at 77 Kelvin minus 196 Celsius. Look at what the vapor pressure of water is at that temperature. It's off the chart. So by using a liquid nitrogen vessel inside our chamber, we can pump out all of the water in our system. It forms ice on that liquid nitrogen container, and we remove it from the system. We don't have to exhaust it. We can just capture it. At the end of the coating or process, we let the system warm up and the water boils off, and we remove it. But during our process, we can get rid of all the water simply by having a liquid nitrogen container boiling inside of our system. 
uh, well, obviously liquid nitrogen doesn't pump nitrogen very well. It doesn't pump oxygen, doesn't pump argon. But think about liquid helium. Liquid helium boils at 4 degrees Kelvin. Look at the vapor pressure of nitrogen, argon, and oxygen at liquid helium temperatures. Liquid helium will condense nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, and any of the other atmospheric gases on its surface if we have a boiling liquid nitrogen container in our system. Well, how do we do that? Um, let's see. These are called, the, as I said, the garbage cans of liquid vacuum pumping. We have several kinds of them. We're going to talk about a, a couple of them. This is what a cryogenic pump looks like. It's just a stainless steel shell with a flange on the top uh, to connect to your vacuum system. If we cut it away, this is what the inside looks like. The yellow or bronze colored piece in the center is basically a refrigeration unit. There's an external compressor, but the gas is expanded here and it cools all of these fins down to quite low temperature. We'll talk about that in just a moment. This is what it looks like in a little bit more detail. The chevron shaped at the top is actually cooled to liquid nitrogen temperatures. It's using helium, but it's cooling it to about liquid nitrogen temperatures because we want to pump out the water on a different surface than we pump out the oxygen and nitrogen and argon on because otherwise the ice would just build up enormously. And then these other surfaces, uh, the first one doesn't have any coating on the back, but these actually have uh, activated charcoal on the back side to give more surface area so when the ice forms due to the condensation, uh, we can capture more gases. And this last uh, surface here is the one that's cooled all the way down to liquid helium temperatures and it can pump everything, uh, basically. So we've talked about the pressure ranges of various pumps, often called rough vacuum on the right-hand side, and we use compression pumps there. High vacuum in this range from 10 to the minus 4 to 10 to the minus 8 torr. We tend to use momentum transfer pumps there. And in ultra high vacuum, if you need to get this to a lower pressure, we use capture pumps. The capture pumps can be used uh, up at higher pressures as well, but they have to be used when we get down to these kinds of pressures because the, even the uh, momentum transfer pumps no longer work at those very low pressures. And any vacuum system for coating will have a combination of pumps because the mechanical pump doesn't get you to low enough pressure. The diffusion pump can't operate at high pressure. So you start out pumping with one, transfer the system over to another, and large production systems will often have a roots blower as an intermediate uh, pumping system as well. Finally, we'll be talking about thin films, not just the ways to generate them, and we'll look at some of the production tools to make them. I want to, again, emphasize how very thin these thin films are. Uh, imagine this is a, a vacuum thin film, 100 nanometers thick, on the surface of a glass substrate as illustrated there. If this, this is a magnified drawing, obviously, if this uh, uh, 100 nanometer thick piece of uh, or thin film were on a piece of one quarter inch glass uh, and the image on the screen were four inches thick, it's a little bit higher than that. How Can you guess how far away the other surface of the glass is? It's more than four miles away. That's how thin these coatings are when we're talking about vacuum thin films. And that's a relatively thick vacuum thin film, to put it into reference. Here's all you need to do evac vacuum evaporation in a lab scale system. At the bottom here, there's this coil. The heater basket, just like these we have here. You put current in them, you generate an evaporant flux, convert the solid to a vapor. Our substrate is up here. We have a shutter in between. Those are just conveniences to make sure we have control. We have a heater labeled A behind the substrate if we want to heat up the system. And what's labeled C there is a monitor so we can actually check how much material is being evaporated at the same time. Looks relatively simple, but all the action actually is down below where we have the pumping stack. So we have a, a cooled coil here, a refrigerated coil. Here's our liquid nitrogen vessel. It's vented to atmosphere, but it's got liquid in there. So this entire surface is at liquid nitrogen temperature and the vapor pressure of water is basically zero above that liquid nitrogen vessel. We then have another chevron trap here, basically, because we have a diffusion pump here. 
uh, it generates a lot of heat. We don't want to heat up the liquid nitrogen, so we have a water-cooled trap in between and no direct path for optical radiation from the diffusion pump to the liquid nitrogen trap. So a lot of complication in the pumping system. Here's a large-scale resistance evaporation system for decorative coatings. Um, that cylindrical body has lots of little parts stationed on it. There's a bunch of tungsten filaments going down the center of it. Right here labeled the evaporation system. The, the cylinder is about six feet in diameter. I've been nearby them. I know how big they are. Um, there are these are the second image is the parts on the cage after coating. On the left <clears throat> image, they're looking black going in. On the right, uh, they're black plastic now coated with aluminum and nice metallic uh, shiny look to them. And these are some examples of coatings that I took at home. This is my son's uh, trophy from karate. It's just aluminized plastic. It looks gold colored. I'll show you why, how that's done in just a moment. We do that by putting a very thin coating of a yellow lacquer over it. Here's a large scale e-beam evaporation system for optics, for, like for example, my eyeglasses. And the substrates are, or the eyeglass blanks are held up at the top in each of those little circular holes. We've got electron beam sources down here at the bottom and actually has the capability of coating one side of the lens, flipping it over and coating the other side of the lens so you get, this is probably seven layers of alternating high and index, high index, low index coatings on my lenses and they do both sides in one vacuum pump down, used for ophthalmics, used for photographic lenses, all kinds of lenses of all sorts. This is for tool coating. Uh, those are drill bits going into a coater. If you go to the local big box store and buy a titanium coated tool bit, they last a lot longer. It has a gold color. It's actually titanium nitride. It both gives it lubrication, but also very hard. And so these are used for tool bits, but they're also used for automotive parts. Uh, the bezels on watches, you can make it titanium uh, nitride look gold. And so oftentimes, what looks like a gold watch is titanium nitride. It's actually more durable than a gold watch. Uh, we can talk about some of that as well later. This is a metalizer for spreader coating C, uh, CDs and DVDs, compact discs and DVDs. One of the amazing things that when people first come into this is a CD is coated every second, actually a little faster than that. They, it takes two stampers, the plastic molding equipment to keep up with one metalizer, we can actually work twice as fast as the, the stamper can work. Here's a fast cycle sputtering system and what's going into it are lenses for automotive applications, big pieces of plastic. Uh, what you I want to explain here that she, the operator is loading or unloading coated parts from that one side. There's actually two doors on this chamber. So one door is closed, it's being coated. The other door opens the other way, you can unload coated parts, load uncoated parts, so when these are being coated, as soon as you're done with that, you can load up another set without having to wait between uh, venting and pump down cycles. I do roll-to-roll -roll coating, like a lot of people at 3M, uh, coating of plastic films inside of a vacuum chamber. We have a roll of film which is unwound, goes over past the source and is rewound, and we coat enormous quantities of film very quickly. The largest coders are in Europe. They're four and a half meters wide, and they operate at up to 3,500 feet per minute, which is like 40 miles an hour is the speed of the film moving through. That. That's why potato chip bags are basically free. Here's an image of one, uh, a small version of one, uh, made by uh, Applied Films. Uh, we basically coat the full width of four and a half meters by having multiple sources. There's a ceramic bar every four inches across the width of that four and a half meters, and we feed wire, aluminum wire from down below here into that, onto those sources continuously as the film moves by. And we do that for all kinds of uh, applications for decorative packaging, uh, for snap, for barrier films, for capacitors, for example. Something like 8,000 square miles of plastic is coated every year worldwide uh, for these kinds of applications. And I have some examples. We have. This is just to make it look shiny on the shelf. That looks good. This is actually a microwave susceptor to heat bread without making it tough and soggy. Here's a, a 
lamp from an overhead projector, a dinosaur these days, but these lamps are used elsewhere. And this is actually the uh, reflective, uh, Fresnel reflector from the front of a Mercury Sable that we built a number of years ago, and holograms. This is just decorative for kids on the inside of SpaghettiOs. There's an image of some superhero in there somewhere. But we can make these systems very large. This is a paper metalizer. That's not a midget. That's a full-size guy. But all that paper has about 4% moisture, so we're literally putting pounds of moisture inside the system, and we know that it expands dramatically, as we talked about earlier. We have to manage that, and we can. We use paper for putting labels on beer bottles and cigarettes, and here's a, my favorite brewer in, in, over in my home state of Wisconsin, uh, and maybe you like that too. We can do sputtering at large areas. These happen to be sputter sources that are 84 inches long. You can make them basically as long as you want. There's no limit to how long you can make them. This is for roll coating, again, coating a plastic film, and the film would rotate on a drum inside that semicircular uh, space in the middle of all those sources used for making window film. I don't have an example of window film with me, but it's also used for making flexible circuits for solar cells, touch panels, and uh, interconnects for all of our electronic devices that have become uh, we can't live without. Also made roll-to-roll -roll vacuum coating on the, on the film is used for the security inks that are used in our uh, currency out in Santa Rosa, California. Here's an architectural glass coating system. One of the amazing things about this, it's, it's pretty, pretty long, but it coats one 10-foot by 17-foot sheet of glass every 20 seconds. It starts out at one end. It's washed first, dried, goes into the vacuum system in a continuous path, a pump down, another door opens, goes further, and five to seven layers go on that, and it spits out one sheet of glass every 20 seconds. That's why when you go to a big box store these days and you buy a window for your home, you can't buy it that's not low E. To get clear glass is now a special order. Fifteen years ago, low E was a special order, and now it's basically ubiquitous. The world's largest vacuum system, or almost at the end, is this one built by who else? NASA. The door is 50 feet square. Uh, it's at their space power facility in Ohio. Here's some particulars about it. It's got enormous pumping. It can get down to 10 to the minus 6. It's, you can heat things up. You can cool them down to minus 320s F. It's, a, it's just a behemoth. I've never seen it, but it might be fun. So three reasons for vacuum evaporation. Reduce the boiling point. Reduce the scattering. Reduce the reactions with air. If you don't take home anything today, take home those. Uh, the wizard once asked, why aren't young people interested in becoming wizards? His wife said, they are. The wizard said, how do you know that? They call them geeks now. I'm proud to be your vacuum geek. I want to thank Varian for the donation of the pump, for the Teledyne Hastings for the gauging system, and 3M for the uh, production of the, the uh, web stream. And I'm open for questions and comments. Thank you very much.